Here we're going to talk about how if you take any object and you hang it from a single point, it sort of ends up hanging so that its center of mass is directly below the point. So for instance, if I had this weird forceps here and I wanted to know where is the center of mass, I'd start by hanging it here, and then I would hang it here, and then I could even hang it here. So I'm going to show you in detail how, how you calculate this and how you can use, use it to find a center of mass. But let's not do those forceps. Let's find something simpler. Let's start with four masses connected by light rods in a square, because that's sort of an ideal object to start with. And we know where the center of mass of this is by symmetry and intuition, I guess. We know that the center of mass is there. If these all have the same mass, and it's a square, that's where it would be. So now let's imagine that we put a pivot point, or we put, you know, put it on something that allows it to rotate around that axis, and just let it go. Well, you can see it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall this way. It's actually going to be an oscillator. It's going to go back and forth forever. But let's say there's some damping force where eventually it ends up um, at its most stable position. So that's what, we're, that's what we're, we think, that stable position should have this directly below that. That's what we want to find out. And that's generally true in statics. So to approach it mathematically, we're going to say it could be at some angle. So let's draw it at some angle. So here we go like that. Could be like this. Right, where these are stall mass m, a side length l. And now we say, oh, it's rotated to an angle theta. And the question is, uh, it's sort of stable at what theta? Or it's static at what theta? All right. So here we go. Let's say statics. You say sum of the forces equals 0, and the sum of the torques equals 0. And often you're building up a bunch of equations because you have a bunch of unknowns. But here we only have one unknown. Our only unknown is the angle theta. So the forces actually aren't going to tell us anything in this case. We really just want to do a torque uh, uh, condition around one axis to find one angle. That's really all we're doing. OK, so let's do that. Let's do torque around that axis. And we need to do it for really just three of the masses, right? because this one is on the pivot point. So we know that mass, the gravitational force on that mass will create no torque. So we're going to number them, I believe, 1, 2, and 3, and figure out what angle gives us no torque. OK, so here we go. Let's see. So we could start, let's round them like this, 2 and 3, and start summing them up. So for 1, really, let's really do it in terms of our r cross f's. This is a good chance to practice r cross f. So for 1, this is the axis. There's r. And then f is the mg straight down. So I'll kind of draw them over here to separate them out for you. So that r is actually a length l. right? So this is the vector r, but its magnitude is l. mg is that way. So we got to think, let's see, if we were to add these tail to tail, then the angle we want for r cross mg, it looks like it's uh, 90 minus theta. Right, because there's theta, because there's theta, and this is 90. So that angle that's left, or that's r, is, is 90 minus theta. So that one must be um, L, because that's the, the vector, mg uh, sine of 90 minus theta. But then it's going to tend to turn it clockwise, so it's negative. So there we sort of did the cross product manually. We just put in the sine of the angle. We made it negative because it's actually a negative angle from r to, uh, to mg. OK. Now let's see. We also want uh, the second one. I sort of messed up my position on the board here, but that's OK. The second one is here. So now here is r for the second one. So it's kind of down like that. And then mg is straight down. Let's kind of draw the second one. It's sort of like this, r, and then mg. All right, so let's think, what would that be? I'm going to go ahead and add it here. This one is also going to tend to make it go clockwise, so it'll also be negative. Um, the length here is square root of 2l. It's across the diagonal, minus square root of 2l. 
the force is mg, so mg. All right, let's see how I'm doing here. Oh, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm really getting it right. And now we just need that angle, and that was a weird angle. So the sine of what is it? It's sort of like this one, 90 minus theta, but it's 45 more because it's across the square. So I called it 90 minus theta um, minus 45. Okay. It's minus 45 because that 45 is making this angle smaller. All right, so you have 90 minus theta, take off 45 more, and then that's that term. All right, and then finally, there's this one. So again, let's see, this one, R is L again, and this one's going to drive it this way, so it's actually positive. So we would say plus, oh, and I can't quite fit it, I'll put it down here, plus, um, let's see, it's L, M, G, and then the sine of what horrible angle have we built up this time? Um, Let's see, it was zero when you turned it theta, so this one is just theta. Yeah, times the sine of theta. So the sum of those three terms, we're trying to make zero. What, for what theta is the sum of those terms zero? Let's do some easy stuff. Let's see, let's cancel the LMG. Okay, I'll do that, you do the rest. LMG. All right. What are we left with here? So let's see, the sine of 90 minus theta is a cosine of theta. So we can do that. We'll bring this, call this cosine theta. Okay, that was a good one. And now we have the square root of two left. And we have the sine of uh, 90 minus 45 minus theta. Let's do 90 minus 45 and uh, call that pi over four. So this one we can't turn from a sine to a cosine or something because it's got a 45 in it. Right? It's not just pi and pi over 2. And then this, we're just going to leave this plus sine theta equals 0. Oh, what a mess. Let's see. So what we're left with is um, minus cosine theta minus the square root of 2. And now we actually have to turn this to from sine a minus b and use the identity. Uh, where, let's see, if it's sine A minus B, it's sine A cosine B. So sine pi over 4 cosine theta uh, is minus cosine pi over 4 sine theta. So that's just an identity to break up that uh, sum in the argument of those two. And then plus sine theta. This is really complicated. But it's about to get simple, because let's see, what is this? This is square root of 2 over 2. And what is this? This is square root of 2 over 2. So we can pull out a square root of 2 over 2, because those two are the same thing. And what is square root of 2 times square root of 2 over 2? It's 1. So that just went away. So we're left with cosine minus cosine plus sine plus sine is equal to 0. So let's see, sine plus sine, so let's bring it up over here, 2 sine theta minus cosine minus cosine minus 2 cosine theta equals 0, right? Mm, let's cancel the 2 and say sine theta equals cosine theta. So sine theta over cosine theta equals 1. When does that happen? 45 degrees, right? You could go further and take the tangent. But the main place that happens that we care about for how this falls is 45 degrees. And when it falls 45 degrees, it looks like this. It's hanging as you would expect, where if you have your pivot point here and you draw a line straight down with gravity, the center of mass will be under the pivot point. So that's all we needed. We needed to find an angle of 45 degrees there to confirm this sentence. Now to use that for a complicated object like the forceps, or let's draw a more complicated object. Let's draw a nice two-dimensional complicated object, like, you know, something like, oh, I should have thought of this ahead of time, a house, right? So you have a little thin house. You want to know where the center of mass is. You could hang it like this, and symmetrically you can see it's going to hang straight down, and you could draw a line on it like that. And then you could hang it again from, say, um, this part 
hang it here. What's it going to do? It's going to fall a little bit. It's going to end up uh, kind of like that. It's going to do something like that, right? So you can draw a line there, because you know the center mass is somewhere along that line. But from your other one, you knew the center mass is somewhere along this line. And you can do more and more, and eventually you can find where they cross. You really just need two. Where those two cross, that is the center mass of the object. So it works well for two-dimensional objects. Three dimension, you kind of have to draw a line through an object. It's a little more complicated. But we definitely saw it. We know it's true that the only way you can have the torque equal to zero is that the center mass falls directly under the pivot point.